Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's uh, version of Let's Light. This is going to be our finale. Yay! So for those that haven't seen the run-up to this one, we have all of our videos on our YouTube channel. You can find us on uh, Academy of Animated Art on YouTube. Uh, you can find all, like I said, everything that's been leading up to this moment. So, so far, we have gotten an animated scene. We have found some reference. We started lighting it. We did some rough block out lighting. We did a rough slap comp to get our final look. We went back into the Maya session, redid our lights from scratch. Um, let's see what else we do. We, we broke out render layers. We had a, a, good, a good video on that. Um, and now we're ready to, 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 we've got everything rendered out, which took an extra week, sorry for that. And now we are ready to uh, composite it back together. So there's two things I wanna show you tonight. I'm gonna show you how I set up some eye layers. I'm gonna do that first. Uh, second up, we're gonna do a composite. I'm gonna just show you kind of from the ground up uh, how I structure the composite. So I wanted to keep these real. I wanted to keep these genuine. So I didn't rehearse them too much ahead of time. I, I like played around with some stuff. I can already, already tell a couple things are a little janky, but we'll work through them. And, um, and then, cause what would happen now is we would uh, create the final image or like we would, build the comp, run it, take a look at it. And that's when we start hitting the notes. And I feel like we've done a lot of that um, for anybody that's been through our courses or been through our, you know, the, the, all the lighting critiques we gave during quarantine. Again, there's like 13 of them. You can find them over on YouTube. Uh, you know that this process is this repetitive process of like lighting stuff, showing it, getting feedback, making the necessary adjustments and continuing to build from there. Um, I'm no different. Jasmine's no different. Our, our, our lighting supervisors on shows. I don't care if you're Sharon Callahan and you've been doing this a long time, you will light something and then you'll want some kind of feedback from the director or somebody working on it um, to continue to build your work. And whether it's, like I said, whether it's director, whether it's just like another artist, I, who you trust, that feedback will always happen. So we're not going to get too much into that. Instead, this whole series is about getting it to that point um, and showing you my structure for doing it. Okay, enough preamble, I'll get into it. And as always, I don't know if I always do this, but I should always do this. As my, um, uh, one of my things is that the way that I do things is like the way that I do them, it doesn't make it perfect. It doesn't make it the only way that you can do it. Um, it's just the way that I work. And this is, um, this is kind of the way that I do things. So as you all know, actually I should pull this up. Um, Let's see. So we've got uh, we've got this animated scene. We've we've rendered out our character. We've rendered out our background. Um, I did some eye layers. I did an ambient occlusion pass. Um, and a, a couple of these. I can go ahead and delete delete one of these. We have some reference imagery down here that we were trying to match to. We did some roughing out of it and all that good stuff. But now, like I said, I wanna show you how I got two uh, render layers for the eyes. Number one is, I, I always do this, no matter like what character I'm rendering and what situation, I always get, generate two passes. One, it'll be tough to see, but this is uh, the eye reflection. So it's the geometry of an eye basically turned into a mirror ball uh, and then reflecting the surroundings because I wanna get the actual reflection of what's around them. Uh, and the other one is, uh, this is a little bit janky because the IGO isn't what I was anticipating it being, but I'll show you what I did here. This is basically an RGB pass to generate some IDings. Um, so in the, uh, I went ahead and just made these as separate Maya files. So in this Maya file, I have all the geo, and this is that first one. This is the eye reflecting the surroundings. And what I did was I kept the lights in there and I, uh, the biggest thing that I did was I selected all the geometry that wasn't the base of the eyes and I went into our attribute spreadsheet and went over to render and I turned off all primary visibility. So I don't want primary visibility on anything. I only want the elements to show up in the reflections and same thing with all of the, uh, all the set pieces as well. So everything in the environment, exact same thing. Attribute spreadsheet, primary visibility off. The only thing that's on are our actual IGO. And by the IGO, I actually mean the outer part of the eye. So we've got that on this side and that on this side. So we've got their primary visibility on. 
And the result, and I'll just do it from here, is this out of the way. And the resulting image is, let's do it from the other camera so you can see. Weird. Render interrupted, huh? Well, you can see it from here. Basically, again, it's the eye geometry. Let's load in the, um, let's load in a reference image here. So you can see, so this is what we had. So you can see the eyes are in that position. It's the entirety of the eyeball um, reflecting the surroundings. I'm not worried about this extra space up here because I know that in the comp, I can grab a crypto mat of the eye properly occluded by the eyelid and just use that reflection. So that's what I did there in the other file. And then I rendered all that out. So that was my eye reflection layer. I did an eye dings pass. And in that one, what I did was uh, basically have the same shader set up on the eye, um, you know, made the eyeball just like a pure metallic reflection, crystal clear. And what I wanted to do in this one was position some uh, specular highlights for eye dings, right? So that we can uh, adjust those and add those in the comp later. So what I did was you can see it here, Again, we've got our eyes turned on. For some reason, the shirt just was being really stubborn. And even though it's off, it's still displaying in here. I'm not really sure why. Uh, but what I did was I set a, a red circle, a green circle, and a blue circle. The blue circle I set over here, it's, it's actually a disc as his eyes are facing this way. And as he rotates to the front towards the end of the shot, I've got these two reflecting in his eye there. And you can see, When we render this out, you can see the uh, specular highlights that are being picked up here. And then depending on the frame, they'll kind of be in different positions. So th what this will allow us to do is isolate their, like if I just wanted, so basically what I did was I found like a good position for the, Render. Oh wait, let's go back to 291. That'll match up this. Oh weird. Huh. I wonder why that's not lining up with the actual eyes. Are we in the wrong camera? There we go. Okay. So what I did in this particular version, if I clean up, is that I wanted like a little bit of an eye ding on the, um, like right here on his eye. So I allowed the red one to fall right there and then I'll ignore all the reds on this eye. And then this eye, I wanted a little eye ding right there. So I positioned the green so that that was there and then I can ignore all the other greens on it when I'm doing the eye ding. And there's a blue one out there. Again, it's behind the face so we won't have to worry about that in the comp. So that's all I did. Uh, whether that those are gonna work out, we will see. But basically, okay. So now we've got our comp. We've got our beauty character. We've got our beauty background. We've got an ambient occlusion. We've got some eye stuff going on. Cool, cool, cool. So what I usually do when I start is I begin. With the background. Let's see, make sure I've got this in there loaded correctly. And again, if you all have any questions about anything, don't be afraid to hop in on the uh, chat window. I'm kind of periodically checking the uh, chats in Slack and Zoom. And I am also checking uh, the Facebook comments as well. So feel free to do those in there. Oh, one other thing I wanted to show you. Okay. So I went ahead and I rendered the background. And as you can see here, I'm gonna just start playing this so this loads. Um, actually, maybe we can just scrub through it. See if that'll work. So I don't know if you guys remember, but from the last version, uh, ugh, this is loading very slowly. But basically what we did 
was we only rendered out frames 80 through 110 on the background. And that is allowing us to only render out the full frame range of where the camera is moving. And now what we're doing, because based on the uh, default settings in Nuke, is it'll go ahead and hold the frames before and after that. So as you can see, frames one through 80 load up really easily, but then once we start to get to these in the middle, they, they have to animate the one. So we were able to save some file size. We were able to save a lot of render time by not rendering uh, the entirety of the shot in there. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna start with my background. And I wanna go ahead and um, the first thing I always do is I add a reformat. And that's in case I need to render this like in the future, if I need to render it a low, lower resolution or a higher resolution for whatever reason, um, it'll always zero back to our 1920 by 1080 project file. So if, I, if, I, if I'm down here, let's, let's, let's show this. So if I'm down here and let's say later on, I draw a roto shape and I make this area brighter right? Makes that area brighter. And now, if I hadn't done this uh, reformat node, I would just you know, have this here. It's all good. It's all cool. But let's say that um, I actually needed to go back and render, and I was like, man, this is really noisy. I need to render this at double the, cam the camera res scale. Now, actually, it's a little bit janky, but basically, what would happen is the roto shape would be like moved to a different location because now it's a roto shape being drawn on a 3840 instead of a 1920 image, and it would, it would just be in the wrong spot. So by defaulting this to the reformat and putting everything through a reformat node, uh, we, can, we can actually um, get, every, get the, the roto shape in the right spot every time. So no matter what the original render is, if you have to change that, everything kind of comes out. After that, I always add a unpremalt and a premalt. And I space these guys out, and I know that any color corrections are going to have to happen in here, because we always want to unpremalt out the alpha and then premalt it back in. Just makes uh, avoids a lot uh, later on. So you can see down here these little uh, purple guys down below. Those are all just like my default reformat nodes. So I know that I'm going to have a background, and over top of that, I'm going to have a foreground, and I'm going to go ahead. And have this layered over top of that. Great, right? Let's go ahead and frame 291. We'll go to the end here. Two ninety-one. There we go. Okay, we got the, got the character over the background. Very basic, very straightforward. I always like to layer back to front. So everything, whoa, I hit the space bar. I'm back here, okay. So now we always know that when we're kind of looking back through a comp after the fact, we know that anything that happens in the background needs to happen up here. Everything that happens in the foreground happens down here. We talked about this ahead of time. I know that I want to add a little uh, depth of field to this. So we're going to go ahead and blur up the background a little bit. We're going to add like a, 15 pixel blur back here. Because of the setup, because we were able to render this separately, nice and easy, I don't need to pull any Z-depth data. If I really want to get fancy with it and, add, and pull some focus here on the foreground, I could run some Z-depth on this guy there. Uh, I would probably do that in the end, but just to, just to kind of start to build this together, I'm going to go ahead and defocus that out in the background a little bit. Uh, additionally, if, let's see, oh, we also have a volumetric light, which I forgot to read in. That's what I was missing. There we go. So now we got this volumetric light shining in here. Um, if I wanted, I could kind of layer it over top of everything. But really what I want to do is I don't want it to, I kind of want to control the way it looks on the character separately from the background. So I'm going to go ahead and add it to the background first. It's pretty mold too low. And so now instead of it being over, we're gonna go ahead and plus it over the top of this. So now we've got this volumetric light shining through. 
and it's happening there. We'll also add it a little bit to the character as well. There's a couple of different ways that you can do this, but just for starters, we can go this way. And same deal with him. On free malts to start and pre malt. Add this over top of him there. Make sure to control this inside his alpha. So now we've got that. If I only want, I only want this like a slight fit over him. So I can, I can either control this plus multiplier down here or I can go into this and grade it down. And what I'm doing here is just stepping down with the, the down uh, arrow. So I just want like a little bit on him and less in the background. The reason why I did that separately was a couple reasons. Number one, I rendered the foreground and background together and I wanted to layer them separately so that when this got blurred, it blurred that as well. It's a little bit much, I think. So maybe we can, you know, let's go ahead and grade this. We can, we can do a couple of gradings here. So the two things I'm seeing is A, it's, it's penetrating too deeply into the space and B, it's just like, it's just too much overall. So we can kind of tone it back down into here um, to get it away from this in the foreground. I'm just gonna kind of soften this up a lot, but just get us started. Kind of something in there. And if we make this soft enough, it shouldn't really be noticeable when the camera move happens. So I'll soften a little bit. We'll go ahead and uh, blur it up a little bit. Take down this grade. A little bit here. And then instead of it being inside that, we actually want to invert it. And now you can see it's kind of taken down in that region there. We can pull that in a little bit, even if we want it more. I think how we want to do this. So maybe just kind of follow along his side and then a little bit further out from that. That'd be good. Okay. So that is kind of how I want. Oh, and there's something else I noticed too. So by default, um, Noop will load 10 of these attribute editors and what happens, which I don't like because the second I, I click on a roto shape and I just try and get it to go away, it's like I have to click 10 different things when really all I ever need is two of these input, the, the two most recent things that I selected. And it's just become my workflow when I'm like, okay, I don't want this road. I want to see its effect. I just double click two kind of random things in the shot. And then I can kind of uh, take a look at that. Okay, so now we've got the character. We've got them over the background. We've got the background blurred out a little bit. We've got some um, uh, uh, volumetric light in there. Uh, we can also, if we want, add in a little bit of ambient occlusion into the background if we want to kind of ground some of these, these shadows. I ran this kind of on a whim just to see if I would like it. Uh, just multiply it over for now. So it actually adds some nice darkening to the background back there in some of these areas. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that in. Uh, if you want, we can also test it on the character, see how much we like it on him as well. Um, same deal here. You know, we can even use the same input. Hit M to merge them, A over B, but then we're going to switch that out to B. Multiply instead. Uh, do it only inside of here. Ooh. Hmm. Okay, so now the problem is so that gets added. Oh, weird. Huh. So when did this add the full alpha? So I guess this one did. I guess this. Oh, I guess this, I guess this had a full alpha in there. Huh. So all we have to do, um, we can either, since this is just a plus operation, we can either uh, tell it to ignore the alpha, the A, 
and now we have it back in place. Um, or we could have done a um, channel copy and copied the alpha from the original into that, but that seemed to work out well. All right, so this multiply is really dark. And I guess it gives us a little bit more, but like, I guess it works a little bit. It's helping ground them a little bit more, helping create some darker shadows in there. You know, that's actually working pretty well. It's looking pretty good on his eyes too. Um, speaking of his eyes, we'll go ahead and get into that. So we will start up in on some eye work. So I'm gonna go ahead and allow this stuff to happen later. Um, let's take a look here. So we've got these eye layers. We'll start with the reflection first. I'll show you how I do that. But I'm checking over here. Does anyone have any questions or anything as I'm going? This looks like everything's all clear. I hope you guys are, um, I hope this is going okay. I know I get a little mumbly when I work. It's a difficult procedure to work and talk at the same time. So if I'm mumbling and it's not making sense, just let me know. Um, okay, so we've got the eye dings in here. We've got the eye reflections in here. Got the reformat, cool. I want to um, isolate these reflections into the eyes. Easiest way to do that, we've rendered out a crypto mat out of this. I always grab the crypto mat directly from the render itself. And you can see, we can either select the eyes as a whole, or we can look at the material attribute and just grab sections of it. I think object will allow you to grab sections too. Oh, no, it'll allow you to grab the whole eye. Okay, so we're gonna do this. Select these two points. Cool. Save this. By the way, my nuke was crashing earlier today. So if that happens, I apologize. Just stick with me. Okay, so we'll reformat out of there because now this is only the alpha in here. We can merge it. And because I was doing some insides earlier, I know some people really like to use the, um, uh, the mask node for it. It's, it's, it's really a matter if you want to run things through the B side or the A side of the node. Um, I'm actually not that picky, but I know that some people get very finicky about that. So now we've got just that inside that alpha. And we can go ahead, ugh, get it again. Why is that being funny? So now we can add this A. And if you look at it just out of the gate, it's too much because it's actually layering it over the top. What really what we wanna do is we wanna add in this reflection. So we're still getting the base values underneath it. We're just adding in some of those. And then again, same thing. You can um, take this, you can do whatever you want to it. You can blur it by a few pixels if you want, if you just want something soft. Um, actually, you should probably blur it prior to being inside of that. Might be a little bit too much. But, the, but what happens is, is if you blur it after uh, it's crypto matted, it'll actually start to spill outside the alpha. So that's not great there. We can just keep it like a one pixel blur and then we can grade this and control it if we want. If we want to just tone it down, tone it up a little bit, kind of keep it right in there. So something else that I want to show you uh, that could be valuable is, um, so like I don't like how kind of glowy it is around the edges of these eyes. I'm not crazy about that. Um, so what I can do is I can take this alpha, um, basically that same alpha that we just had, and I can pull an, like some ambient occlusion inside of that because the ambient occlusion will give us a little bit of that edge. And let's see. multiply that in there if we want Ugh. but because we are multiplying it and this alpha has a black all around the outside we actually need to layer it over white and I'll show you this in just a second okay hmm. actually this isn't the best it's not the best Ambient occlusion that we got there. Let's see, if, let me see something. Just, just bear with me for a second. What I'm doing is I'm trying to. I'm wondering why. Oh, sorry. 
wondering why it doesn't look like I'm getting that like dark edge there. Hmm. It usually works a little better. Usually you get like a brighter ambient occlusion there. Let's see if we can do this. Let's take this white point down. Make it contrasty in there. Let's get a little more contrast in there. Let's see what we got. And then we will clamp. And I'll explain, I'll explain some of this here in just a second. Oh, weird. So if this is that, I'm merging that inside of there, okay. Oh, weird. Oh, I see. <laughs> Switch those around. Okay. All right, now it's a little too heavy, but it's working a little bit better. So we can dial in just, you see what I'm saying? Like I, I just want like a little bit of drop shadow in there. There we go, that's looking a little better. Into the eyes. So we want, we want cause we actually kind of want to feel the shadow around the eye. Um, like you want to feel the eyeball set back a little bit. Okay, let's explain what I just did there. So when I'm looking at an ambient occlusion pass, all I'm looking at is white and black values. How bright the brights are, how dark the darks are. Because I know that, that I can either more than likely I'm going to use this as a multiplying factor or I'm going to shuffle this into a channel and it's basically all I'm looking for is the whites and the darks. So anything that's white is going to affect nothing. Anything that's a value of one multiplied, so because it's like a, a math equation, right? So if you have any number, any RGB value and you multiply it by one, it's going to stay exactly the same because eight times one is one, 10 times, I'm sorry, eight times one is eight, 10 times one is still 10, nothing changes. Now these dark values are the, are the different story. These dark values have a value of, let's say, like zero to 0 0.2. So let's say zero. So now we're talking about zero times eight. What's that? That's zero. That takes that value to black. A value of 10 times zero also takes it down to black. So what I'm, what I'm checking is the light and dark values. So what I've done is I've, you know, I've taken this ambient occlusion. I've, I've turned it all over the place. And I've isolated it just inside this region. What does that do? It turns everything else around it black. So if I just go ahead and take that and multiply it by my original, all this stuff outside the eye that is black is now saying, oh, you know what? Wait. All this stuff out here that's black is going to get multiplied by, oh, I know why, because I turned this way down. So if I turn this up to one, you can see it's multiplied by zero and then it goes to black, right? Because it's every all these pixels are more multiplied by zero, so they go way down. Instead, what we do, and I'll go ahead and leave this up to one again so you can see it. Again, what I do is I don't want this to be black, I want it to be white. And so I make it all white. Now, the one thing that I was noticing, and this kind of died on me, was that because I I made I adjust these black points and white points, and because this is an extended pixel uh, range. What I did was I made some of these pixels greater than one. So now when I multiply it, I actually increase the value of it. And I don't want to affect it. I only want to make the dark values a little darker. So I clamp these to only a value of zero to one. So it doesn't actually go beyond one. And now when I put this all together, instead of it being like this, it's now like this, where all this area around him is not affected by what's happening within his eye. And, I can go, and then all I do is I just think that's a too much. I just turn that down a little bit. Okay. All right. Now let's tackle the eye ding a little bit. This one's going to be a little tricky because, frankly, I'm not sure the way that I did this, the way that I chose to do this one is the best methodology for this. I may have to make an addendum video after this. So let's say I wanted to add a little bit of an eye ding like right here, right? Let's say I wanted to go ahead and take, you know, we've got the light coming in from the screen left side. Actually, I want it to come in here. So I want, I want to just isolate just this eye ding and make that, that my main ding. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shuffle this out and just make this the green. Okay. And now 
instead of keeping them both eyes, I just want to shuffle it over to this one eye. Well, how do I do that? I'm going to go ahead and copy over the character layer here just because I don't want to pull noodles all over the place. So I've got this. And I'm going to run a crypto mat on this as well. And like I said, because we have a couple different options, I can say I want to run it as the material. And I just want to isolate just the sclera. So in this, I'll add the color picker and I only select that. Well, now I've got, oh wait, what did I say? Did I do that right? Wait, hold on. Oh, I know, I was doing that backwards. Jeez, okay, so yeah, for this one, I only wanna isolate this one eye. So instead of grabbing both of them, let me go and clear that. And I'll show, I'll show, you, I'll show you where that comes in in just a second. Let's go back to this. So let's just say I just want this eye. Select that, okay. Oop. Merge this. Inside. So now this is only happening in just this one part of the eye. And then what I'll do is I'll plus this over the original. So now we've got a nice, crispy, pure white eyeding right there. Not exactly what we're going for. It's close, it's pretty close. But what we're gonna do is I'm gonna do two things. One is I'm gonna go ahead and I wanna soften it just a touch. So I'm gonna do that by creating a little glow over here. I'm gonna take down this glow size. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, you know, let's go ahead and bring this in. And so now when it's over, it's it's a little bit more um, like softer, but I really want to just take down the overall look of it. And I can I can increase this glow value. And I can decrease the size of it, kind of tighten it up right around there and then I'll decrease the overall contribution. And now it's kind of fitting in that realm. I also wanna go ahead and just color it up a little bit. So we're in this warm setting. So I just kind of wanna want to warm up that reflection. Cause again, it's, it's a reflection of the surroundings. So let's look to see what we got overall. Oh, geez, that's not great. Okay, that happens sometimes when I'm comping. I wish I could say that was scripted, but it totally isn't. So let's see what happened. And what I'm gonna do is I wanna track the alpha. So I've got the alpha channel, okay. And we look here, alpha's fine. Okay, alpha gets a little janky there. Okay, that seems to be where it went wrong. Make sure that it's fine the rest of the way. Yeah, pretty normal stuff happening. So what happened here, right? So let's check the alpha, we got that. There's something about the alpha value in here. It's something about when we multiply this. So let's just multiply maybe just by the RGB. Weird, but even when that happens, okay. That's so strange. Hmm. Okay, so in a situation like this, usually what I would do, especially if I'm in a hurry, is I go ahead and copy it back from where it was previously, and I just put it back to where it was. So now we've got a nice, crispy, clean alpha from the original. Okay, that looks a little better. So now we have our eyes looking a little bit better the way that we want. If I wanted to, let's say I want to punch up the sclera of the eye because I just want that to be a little bit brighter. I'll kind of do what I was doing before, which is I would take the crypto mat and get in there, shuffle this over to the, the uh, material value, only select this, only select this, then reformat. 
Oh, I forgot to reformat here. And then just grade this up within that. So now I can take this and go boop, 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 and make just that area brighter. Okay. All right, now, uh, last thing I wanna do just as a demonstration for this is I wanna go ahead and show you, uh, there's, there's another thing that I, that I would potentially wanna do because I really wanna dial in this, the specular versus diffuse value on a skin. Um, so you can shuffle those out, right? So if I'm, in the, um, if I'm in this region here, I can take this and I can shuffle out the individual components of the skin because of the way that we set up the AOVs. So I can set out his, diffu actually his diffuse value won't be much of anything because, so the diffuse values are just like everything that's not subsurface. His skin will actually be the subsurface ones versus like the specular. And what I can do is I can, I can multiply, I can plus those back together and control those independently if I wanted to. Um, so that, that would be a really uh, a good benefit from that one as well. Okay, so I'm running up on time here. Um, and basically what I'm going to do for my next step in this is I want to go ahead and just kind of, um, and again, I've got a baby coming any minute now or any day now. So I don't want to overcommit to this now. But after all that's done, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, put a final polish on this. Uh, I will, I, I can, uh, my goal is to kind of like really finish this shot, send it out to you guys, get your feedback, make the adjustments that you see so we can just keep going back and forth. Um, but I did want to show you, cause I know, and I wanted to get this on YouTube and I wanted to get this for our students. So you guys can kind of see what my process is from start to finish of, um, kind of creating a shot. So my last step would be, I would just create a right node down here. Actually, what I end up doing usually is I will create two right nodes. Um, and I'll write out like one that's like full res TIFFs or EXRs or something. And another one that's kind of like half res JPEGs just so I can load those a little faster and check them. Um, I find that the low, I find that I end up looking at the low res JPEGs uh, a lot as I'm kind of going through the process. They're also nice to save out iterations, so I can save out iterations along the way. Um, and then I can go from there. So before I sign off, uh, oh, we've got a couple questions over here. All right, let me go ahead and stop. Oh, Clever says, congrats to the baby. What's the name will be? Um, not sharing that one publicly quite yet. We'll get there. Uh, just basically because we haven't fully 100% um, decided on the baby's name yet. It is a little girl. Uh, and so we do know that we have our son, Parker. Uh, my wife and I met in Central Park. And so we named our son after Central Park. Or so we named him Parker. Little girl's not gonna get that original or creative of a name. All right, Clever also asks for uh, the eye ding, the light position would be static or would be an animated light. I find hard to get the right eye ding for all frames during the animation. Yeah, so, okay, that's a great question. So let's, let me share this again. So let's go ahead and just share this guy. So my initial setup is I pick that hero frame. I picked that very last frame and I positioned um, this red light, so it looks good on his screen left eye at the end. This one, so it looks good on his screen right eye at the end. And this one, so it looks good in the very first position that he's in. And we actually only see one eye over there. Uh, what I did was I rendered it out from there because I, a couple, because I don't have the ability and I don't know anyone that does to be able to estimate what it's going to look like across the entire shot. So, um, what I do, it's really just a matter of trial and error. I render it once, I put it in the comp, comp that out, I take a look at it, I'm like, ooh, I guarantee you there's always gonna be bad frames. There's gonna be a few that are bad. So what I end up having to do is, and it depends on show to show, depending on what you do, but I will oftentimes need to animate the, the position of these. And let me go ahead and pull up, see if I can find it. Um, let me stop share for a second and then just pull up the, the actual animation for this. 
things over here. So what I'm looking for here is, okay, let's watch this. So he starts off in that position. He blinks. He looks, he blinks. He rotates, blinks, blinks. Eyes big. Great. Blink. Okay. Let's say, you know, I, I picked an ideal position that works really, really well here. But then as he blinks and looks that way, it, like let's say this eye, I had the ding on the left side, and now it's like dead center in his pupil, right? I'm like, dang it. All right, I got to do something about that. So the way that I would handle that is I would find the exact frame where he blinks, right? And this is what I would do. I would take this and let's say that it happens on frame 120. The blink happens on 120. So what I would do is I would take this, find the position, and I would set a keyframe there, right? So 119, the last frame before he blinks his eye. Frame 120, he starts to blink. I set another keyframe there. 121 is still blinking. Um, and then what I do is I will move this on this frame into the position that works well for the next one. Let's say like I, I played around with it and I discovered that this one actually works out really well. Great. So I can, I, I set a keyframe there and away we go. Now, when like this eyeing will kind of pop over on that one frame, but you will never see it as the audience because it's when his eyes are closed. Um, so it actually, that actually works out better than you think in most situations because the audience isn't really tracking it too well. Um, so I would do that. That would be one way that I would do it. I would also, uh, and this is actually something I'm looking into and I'm hopefully gonna share this to the class soon. Uh, there are ways of, of rendering out like a ST map out of uh, the renderer and using that to control the IDing in Nuke. I've been, I've been able to do it in the past, but Nuke changed some things and I, and I can't really do it anymore. And I have to kind of really do some research into how to get into that again. Um, oh man, did I forget to share my screen? Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Do that. You're just gonna have to take my word for it. No, I'm just kidding. Let me get that back. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Man, okay. Just Bring it back to where it was. Okay, so we've got this guy here, right? It's in the perfect position of what we want. Frame, frame 120, it moves. So set the keyframe there. 119 is the last frame before he blinks. 120 he blinks, set it again so that doesn't move. 21, 21, it's still closed. And actually I could have moved it on frame 120, but like, let's say he's blinking for two frames, 120 to 122. But when he opens his eyes, he's now looking off the side. So what I do is I take this and I swap it out over here and I rotate it around, right? So now it just kind of pops over there on one frame. And you're probably thinking like that, oh, I forgot to set a keyframe. And you're probably thinking like, oh man, that will never work, right? Because like, how can, how can that happen, right? How can there, like it just pop over there on one frame? I guarantee you, that the audience will never see it, it's because he's blinking. His eyes closed and when he's opening it, the ding's just in the right place. They never really ask why. Um, I know it seems like, it, it'll seem like an audience member will be aware of that, but they really aren't. I can show you, in fact, let me stop sharing this again for a second, and I promise I won't forget to reshare it again. Uh, let, me pull up a sh let me pull up some, uh, a good example of this. So the hardest movie that I ever worked on for Idings was Peanuts. I can't believe I'm about to talk to the little redhead girl. So I'm going to show you just a couple shots here. Um, let me show this. Okay, so this is Charlie Brown. Let's go ahead and mute this. He's walking along. So we had a goal for every frame. His eye ding was like perfect and it matched the shape of his, his eye. So we animated it on every single time he blinked, every time he moved, every time he did anything. So like this is actually kind of the hero perfect eye ding for him. His eyes are kind of marbly and the ding is right there. 
even just in that little subtle move, we had to animate it. So watch when he just like pops his eye up a little bit. Bing, bing. Yeah. Snoopy, same eye ding. Everything, every time they blink, every time they move, every time they're kind of um, anywhere, their eye ding is constantly animating. There to there to there to there. Oh, it took so much time. There's so much hand animating for those. There to there. Uh, thank God for this the shot of just his finger. No eye dings in that. Snoopy's got his eyes closed. Okay. Now, literally every time. Oh, I loved lighting the red haired girl because she, you only ever saw the back of her. So you never saw her eyes. There to there to there. Like every, every, every frame. So that was the. Uh, biggest challenge of that and it really it was it was like literally constantly animating constantly kind of shifting around but the audience doesn't pay, doesn't notice um let's see oh amanda asked hi mike sorry if you already mentioned this earlier but is it usually okay to keep elements like the window super ex overexposed if it matches the mood we're going for yep i i do it all the time so uh i um I come from like a photography background and anyone from a cinematography background, um, I utilize very, very bright values a lot. And we do it a lot in the films too. And they're becoming more and more prominent because that's how you get that feeling of like bright sunshine and warmth and everything. Like if you keep everything in a value range of like zero to one, it gets like your image looks a little bit CG because it's a little too perfect. It's about those imperfections. It's about those blowouts that make something feel a little bit more real and feel a little bit more photographic. And also I was using it in this particular shot because it creates a wall of lighter elements and allows the dark tones of the skin character of the character to pop forward. So I was using that volumetric light, all that bright light behind him to create brightness um, as a wall back behind and allow his darker elements to step forward on that. Um, okay, great. This is one of the best tricks I've, I've ever seen with eyes, track, eye dings, positions. Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's just the way you got to do it. Like I've actually got some pretty good eye dings right now. And every time I blink, you could animate them. Oh, oh. And it's, just, it's like you get used to it. It's like a dance. Um, the really hard part of Peanuts was that it was animated on twos. So you had to set a keyframe uh, like every frame because you couldn't interpolate because the eye ding would slip. Like they were like one, one, two, two, like frame one, frame two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if you had like, and if you set your eye ding here at one and here at 10, it would, it would be like sliding as they're like being in the choppy 12 frames a second animation. Very tricky. Um, but that was a big fun movie to work on. Um, all right, we're getting close on time. So does it, what adjustments do you, do with the AOVs on subsurface and specularity. Uh, I will, I will, I uh, will increase, decrease them. I will add color to them. Um, I, I will adjust the colors. I will adjust their value and their intensity. And more importantly, I will, I will isolate them with rotos and and you like maybe add a little extra spec to his face and less to his arms. And I'll isolate them with some garbage mats too. So it's just like kind of piecing them and and reconfiguring them in a way that's that's uh, that's nice. That's, that's, that's usually my go-to. I mean, honestly, I just like having those because who the heck knows what I'm going to use them for. Um, they're really beneficial when you're hitting notes and you're on a tight deadline. So like uh, I used to, I mean, in our old renderer, I was going to, oh, I was going to talk to Nicholas about this at some point. So in our old renderer at Blue Sky in the 10 films that I've worked on up until now, uh, we used a proprietary software that didn't have AOVs um, it didn't even have a GUI. We did everything from command line um, or from text files. So we would uh, assign light properties in a text file. So we give it a location, color, intensity, all in a text file. And then you would do these renders to test it. Um, and, uh, and one of the things about that was like, you would always try and set yourself up in a position to be able to hit notes quickly. Cause the worst would be like, Hey, can you just like get a little more specular highlights on the skin? And you'd be like, oh, that's a really long render. I don't know if I can turn that. It'll be like a Thursday and you gotta, you gotta finish the shot by Friday. Like, man, I don't even know if I can get a frame of that turned around overnight. Um, what you would do is I would set up my own 
AOVs before I knew that AOVs were even a thing. And I would render out the spec pass separately so that I can hit notes very quickly. Um, and it'd be like, hey, you want the spec down on that? No problem. But loop, tone that down, and that would be the end of that. Uh, so AOVs really do give the flexibility of, of late game changes, which is very nice. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So, okay. Well, thank you guys very much. I'll do one last check over here on Facebook to make sure I'm not missing anybody over there. And I think we are all good. Yeah, we are all set. Guys, thank you so much. And like I said, after the baby comes, I will hopefully, uh, we'll see what life has entailed. I'll be able to hop back on. Either way, I mean, like for the students of the lighting for animation bundle, I'm still going to be doing daily critiques with you guys uh, until baby comes. And then I've got Francesco Giraldini, the lighting TD from DreamWorks. He's going to be filling in for me for two weeks um, while I get absolutely no sleep at all. And I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you guys so much. Hope everyone's being safe, being healthy out there. Remember to wash your hands, wear masks, and I will talk to you all very soon. All right. Happy lighting, everybody.